Excellent. So uh, good, good afternoon. I'm Betsy Bishop. I'm the president of the Vermont Chamber of Commerce. Today, we will continue our virtual policy series. Every Monday afternoon through March, we will bring together govern, government and business leaders to get your questions answered, provide access to key Vermont leaders, and bring you up to speed on important policy. Special thanks to our series sponsors, AT&T, Cigna, and Noyle Johnson Insurance. We are glad to offer this series to our Vermont Chamber members and to all businesses across the state. We collected your questions during registration and we'll try to get to all of them. I also encourage you to use the chat function in your sidebar to ask additional questions, selecting in chat to all panelists and all attendees so everybody can join in the conversation. Today is International Women's Day, an opportunity to formally recognize and celebrate the contributions and achievements of women all over the world. I've been a leader of the largest statewide business association in Vermont for over a decade. 75% of my leadership team is female and our board is 42% women. This has been a long-term deliberate ascent toward inclusion and we have much more work to do. And it is within that context today that we welcome Speaker of the House, Jill Kerwinski and Senate Pro Tem, Becca Bailent to our virtual policy series. Having these women leading our legislature is inspiring to so many of us. Speaker Kerwinski of Burlington was elected Vermont Speaker of the House in January. She's the 92nd Speaker and the fourth female Speaker of the House and has served in the legislature since 2012. Senate President Becca Balin of Brattleboro was elected President Pro Tem of the Vermont Senate in January. In addition to her responsibilities as President Pro Tem, she also serves on the Senate Economic Development Committee and the Senate Committee on Appropriations. She has served Wyndham County in the Senate since 2015. So now I'm going to pass the Zoom mic over to our speakers and I'm going to ask each of you if you could talk about your top priorities a little bit, a few minutes each, and then we will delve into the questions. Who would like to go first? Senator Balin, would you like to start? You're on mute, happy, there you go. Yep, happy to, thank you, Betsy. Uh, good afternoon, as Betsy said, I'm Becca Ballant and I represent Wyndham County. I live in Brattleboro with my spouse and two school-aged children. And I realized uh, as Betsy was introducing me that I'm actually the longest serving member of the Economic Development and Housing Committee in the Senate. Uh, it was my first choice to be there as a new Senator. And um, when I was elected as pro tem, I even placed myself back on that committee because I really love thinking about how to help our economic landscape. And, you know, if I could, I want to start with a little story so you can understand a little bit more about me since I am new, new to my position. I don't know if any of you out there, I know I have a lot of business leaders with, with us today. I don't know if any of you have spent any time at home as stay-at-home parents. Um, I know I never intended to ever be in that position. I was a teacher for many years, but when my first child was born, my spouse and I kind of looked at our financial picture and we decided that I would be the one uh, to stay home while the kids were really small. And it was not something that I felt particularly good at and being home for hours and hours uh, was pretty hard for, for my active brain. And I know that some moms and dads uh, can settle into it and really uh, lean into having a, a slower and sometimes more monotonous routine. And I never did. I always felt like I was going a little bit out of my mind. And at the height of my stay at home mom uh, delusions, I had these ideas of starting my own business. And I really loved the idea of creating something from scratch. And in my own mind, right, it was always wildly uh, successful. And I went through all kinds of plans. Uh, one was I was gonna do elbow length mittens, you know, totally brilliant. No kid would ever lose their mittens again. I was so jazzed about this for a few weeks until of course I realized it had already been done by someone who actually knew a whole lot about manufacturing and business. Uh, then I thought I was going to run, you know, kind of a quirky donut shop, followed by gourmet ice cream cart. And then my best, or I could say worst idea was I was going to market a homemade switchel, Vermont's old time energy beverage made from uh, vinegar or pickle juice, ginger and some sweetener. Uh, 
it was awful and not even a flatlander would have purchased it twice and my poor long suffering spouse and my neighbors tried several batches of homemade switchel uh, before I finally gave up on the idea. But I mention it because fortunately for all of us, uh, all of you are actually talented and have entrepreneurial spirit and ideas and the requisite daring that it takes to be in business. And so we're spared for my bad business ideas. And I'm sure you already know this, um, but I wanna highlight it because I think it's a really important data point for us to remember. And that is that Vermont's uh, startup survival rate is about sixth highest in the nation. And we rank seventh in the number of people working for small businesses. And these businesses help our economy hum, but they also help anchor our communities. And so although this statistic is really impressive and it gives me hope for the future, we also know that we need to really target the growth of mid-sized businesses here in Vermont because they can provide the good stable jobs long-term, serve as a base for the economy, but also give workers a job that turns then into career opportunities. And one thing that I have been focused on for years within my own committee is that we cannot grow Vermont small startups into mid-sized businesses without a well-trained, well-educated, workforce. And I know Betsy and I have talked about this for years, and you all know it too. We face a crisis on so many fronts because we, uh, we need to attract more and keep these um, highly trained workers. And I venture to guess that almost every single business on this call is having trouble filling openings. And I initially ran for Senate for two specific reasons. Things in my area, scary trends that I became aware of. Uh, one was the growing number of kids living in poverty. And my child's, uh, at that point I had a kindergartner and a preschooler and at their school, 70% of the children at the school were qualifying for free and reduced lunch. And I found this really alarming, of course. And at that same time, um, I joined the Workforce Development Committee at the Brattleboro Development Corporation. And we realized just how dangerously close to a tipping point we were within Wyndham County. And we did a survey of our, count, our county's employers to figure out how many people were in the pipeline. How were we going to replace those workers who were about to age out? And I've been concerned with this. I know the Vermont Chamber has been concerned with this. It's not unique to my county. And it's partly the reason why the Vermont Chamber had the foresight to fund the Vermont Futures Project and the dashboard, which is such a great tool for all of us who work in policy in Vermont. And as I said, those trends are not anom anomalous in Wyndham County and Vermont's workforce skews over 50. And I'm actually a really good example of that. And I, and I don't kid you, when I joined the Senate in my late forties, I was welcomed into the Senate chamber by some of my colleagues as a millennial. And of course, I'm not a millennial, I'm nowhere near, near being a millennial, but the age skews higher and that's just simply not sustainable. So we have a workforce crisis uh, and this ties into other uh, three other really important issues that I want to touch on in my opening remarks. Um, issues that are on my mind, even as we work through this difficult session under the shadow of the pandemic. And that's the great need we have for more housing that also impacts our ability to attract and retain workforce. A childcare system that truly supports the needs of working families so that we can bring people back into the workforce who want to work but don't have childcare. And then the last one, which I think is a, it's a more difficult and more um, complicated and complex issue to deal with, but I feel we, that we must, and that is to attract and cultivate a diverse workforce. So we have made some progress on housing uh, needs and the childcare system. We're gonna continue to do that. And hopefully with this next federal package, we're gonna have more of, of an opportunity to continue working on those issues. And we're trying uh, like the rest of the nation to wrestle with these really hard issues around racial justice and inequity. And it's crucial that we do it even on the business front. And that's because people of color will become a majority of the American working class in 2032. And that's about 10 years sooner uh, that we thought when looking at long-term long uh, workforce projections from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So we know we have to make the state 
more welcoming, more supportive of a diverse workforce, or we're not going to have the workers that we need to grow our businesses. And of course, you know, I have hardly mentioned the big elephant in the room right now, and that's the year long pandemic uh, that's devastated so many businesses here in Vermont. And that's not because I'm not thinking about all of it all the time and in my communities and in my chamber, but because when I'm with a group of, of leaders like yourself, I, I need also to give myself permission to think beyond the pandemic, to think about the work that still needs to be done as we reopen the economy. And we have to do both. We have to address the despair that so many businesses are feeling, uh, but also tap into that innate optimism and possibility that we have. We are a dynamic state. We are a creative state. That's why we do have such a high ranking for successful startups. And I know that we will come out of this with new innovation and new direction in so many, on so many fronts. And the federal package, it's working its way through the system. It's working its way through the process. We're getting a lot of great news. Uh, we are, our congressional delegation has been able to secure for us, of course, as we all talk about the small state minimum, it means that there's gonna be a lot of money available for broadband investments, resources for tourism and hospitality. And it's also gonna give us the opportunity to free up some general funds and give us more options in the budgets. So I'm, I'm grateful to be here. I'm grateful for your hard work and your, your creativity and also your perseverance during this incredibly hard year. Uh, it's been so painful for so many Vermonters and I wanna thank you for what you do for all of your communities and your workers and their families. And I really look forward to your questions, comments and a, a fruitful conversation between all of us because I always learn something at these events. So thanks again for the invitation, Betsy. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Senator. Uh, I think you've touched on uh, all of the big topics. Um, I hope to hear from Speaker Kwinski as well that these, these are topics that I think we all share and there's a lot of agreement about what we need to do. Um, as a point of reference to both of you and to um, our audience, I just want you to know that a couple of the issues that uh, Senator Balint touched on, specifically the, the federal $1.9 trillion package, we are um, bringing in a federal expert next week on this show to be able to talk a little bit through that. So we'll touch on that. Um, and then we also are doing a panel on diversity, equity, and inclusion as well. So um, I think it's important to touch on this because this is something that we've really worked on to expand our workforce. Um, and so I'm interested in, in that conversation too. Before we get too down, far down that path, um, Speaker Kuwinski, why don't you talk to us a little bit about some of the priorities that you see for your team uh, this session? Hi, Betsy. Thank you so much for having us here today. This is uh, such a great opportunity and I'm eager to start in a conversation with the rest of the crew here today. Uh, I do just want to take a moment. You mentioned, Betsy, in the beginning, we have two you know, things we are recognizing and thinking about today, you know, International Women's Day. Um, that's, I'm really proud that Senator Ballant and I are leading our chambers as first time ever to have two women in these roles, but also that our leadership teams, um, all of our House leaders are um, House majority and two minority leaders are women, and we have a woman serving as lieutenant governor, and I appreciate all the work you've been doing, Betsy, um, to advance women in leadership positions, so thank you for that. And at the same time, you know, we're recognizing and looking that we've been weathering this pandemic for a year now. I, I don't know about all of you, but time during the pandemic has been so bizarre and days feeling like months and weeks feeling like days and months feeling like years. And um, I just, you know, remember those first days in the pandemic when we didn't know how this, this, how COVID would impact our state and how long we'd be faced with this challenge. And now here we are today, a year into it. And I just wanna recognize that we saw Vermonters use their past experience in overcoming adversity to find creative solutions to support our families, our neighbors and our small businesses across the state. I think it's really important that we take the lessons that we've learned as we've worked through this pandemic and not ignore them, but rather use them as we persevere to recover, to recreate a Vermont that works for everyone. 
Uh, January 6th was an historic moment for us, uh, for me to gavel in the House of Representatives on Zoom and to start uh, governing uh, our, our remotely for this entire session, which is a, just a, an, a thing of its own, I will have to say, and recognize your support in helping um, give us your thoughts and feedback on this online environment. I know it's really challenging. My, my goal from day one has been to build a recovery plan that leaves no Vermonter behind. And as I started to build what that looked like um, and with, with House members, with Senate leadership and talking with Vermonters and businesses across the state, it was clear that the challenges that we had been working on before the pandemic were only made worse because of it. Access to affordable childcare, um, broadband and infrastructure, affordable housing, all key things that we need to have thriving communities and businesses, uh, we still needed to work on and we needed to work, work and focus on even more. And I know that our small business community has suffered tremendously during this pandemic. Two things that we can and we must focus on is creating space for potential employees and future business owners to enter the workforce and succeed. Uh, data has shown us that not only women have been disproportionately affected by the pandemic, but they were previously not able to access career opportunities because lack of available childcare. Uh, by creating access to affordable childcare and coupling it with access to targeted workforce training opportunities, I believe we can help a previously restricted population enter the workforce or finally have the opportunity to start the businesses they had long been planning for no matter what they were, right, Senator Ballant? <laughs> I, I just, Vermont businesses have been consistently uh, discussed the need for more workforce participation. And while we continue to attract families and individuals from other states, I believe we have the opportunity to create employment opportunities right here at home for Vermonters. And while we work on these policies that help people get back to work, it's also important that we continue to work on our long-term challenges like stabilizing our public higher education system, working on social equity and racial justice issues, and dealing with our unfunded pension liability. Uh, lastly, I, I'm proud that before we left for our town meeting break, we passed a nearly $80 million COVID relief bill that included $10 million for small businesses that received no federal assistance, and that is now off to the Senate for consideration. We are starting to look at what the federal relief bills mean for us and the timing of that funding and how that will look. Um, we have some incredible opportunities at this moment to take advantage of as we continue to build a recovery plan that leaves no Vermonter behind. So I'm so excited to be here with you. I hope all of you and your families are doing well and weathering this, this pandemic together and look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much. And I, I think um, where you ended uh, might, might be a good place for us to start the conversation. Um, you know, both of you referenced workforce as being sort of the key issue. And, um, you know, we, we've recognized that we, prior to the pandemic, we had a, a 10,000 worker gap in workforce participation. And we have been uh, working to make sure that we have mature workers and workers coming out of our correction systems and new Americans all sorts of populations, those that are in Vermont, outside of Vermont, will we'll take all comers. Um, but then the pandemic hit, right? And uh, I, I, we haven't seen the numbers yet because they lag a little bit, but I, I feel pretty confident in knowing that that hasn't improved during, during the pandemic. And so that becomes a, a serious issue. But because of the pandemic, um, what we've seen is one issue rise even above that, and that is the survivability of these businesses. And I think a big thank you goes out to the leadership of you, both of you and your um, respective chambers in helping get uh, businesses through this with $320 million in grants to help through September 30th. Of course, the problem has continued. So we have ongoing and new debt now. And 
So I guess I'd love to hear from both of you. Um, I know we don't know all the details of what's coming in the federal bill. We knew, certainly know some, but to the extent that there's discretionary funding for the states like there was in the last bill, do you anticipate um, being able to extend uh, similar type economic recovery grants to businesses again uh, from that, those funds? Uh, Speaker Kerensky, why don't you start first? Yeah, Betsy, that's a great question. We are just beginning to get briefed on what the federal relief bill looks like and what it holds. So I can't speak to specifically the issue around grants because the language is pretty broad right now, but so there were several things that were highlighted specifically like broadband. And I think broadband is one uh, that uh, 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 an issue that I've heard about every day since I have been speaker, the need to have um, broadband reaching the end of every road in every town in our state. And there is um, a specific call out for, for broadband in there and other infrastructure needs that I think is, is gonna be really important. I think that the other part of, as we learn about what's in this federal relief bill is what money can we spend from general funds that we can, um, that we can move these special COVID funds in to help us free up money to do other programming and or continue some programs that are in desperate need right now because of the pandemic. And so we'll be looking at what that looks like as we, um, as we get this new information. The other thing to remember is that when they pass the bill, it doesn't mean that the money just automatically gets transferred to Vermont. And this is the part that we really struggled with last session was the timing that it took for them to put the rules together, the specific rules and guidelines of how the money can be used. So even if the money is approved, um, in, in April or May, we may not get that until later in the summer. So that's another piece that we are monitoring closely because that's really important. Well, and I will say that um, we understand that timing and we certainly think that you folks in the legislature acted with the speed that, that you could. Uh, and we saw that not only in May, but in the summer and then again in the okay. fall. And uh, we're hoping that and working with your committees now to make sure that some of these things are lined up so that the speed can happen when it can. So we certainly yeah. understand. Senator Ballant. Yeah, and that's something earlier this afternoon, uh, the speaker and I were on a call with Joint Fiscal Office and our, the chairs of our money committees talking about this exact thing, the timing, how are we going to make sure we have things queued up, you know, grease the skid so that we have it ready to go. And it could be that we have to do, I mean, I don't think it's what anybody wants, but it could be that we're gonna have to keep the keep the budget open, you know, maybe come back again for a shorter, you know, time in August and September. We just don't know yet. It's too early. And so the thing that I was most excited to hear about in this most recent package, just because we really haven't had uh, much of a light shine on a light shown on it yet. And Betsy, you and I have talked about this, the need for more money to our performance spaces, our gathering spaces, our restaurants, the tourist industry. There is a sizable amount uh, referenced in this package related to those industries. And I know those are some of the industries in Vermont that have been the hardest hit. And so what we've also learned is we, we, we stand up the programs, we get the money out, we're in communication with ACCD, and then we find out actually we left out some segment unintentionally. They somehow you know, fell through the cracks. And I think we're gonna to continue to see that um, as well. But I think you can imagine that there's going to be a sizable amount of money going out to, to specifically to, to our small businesses here in Vermont. They really are, as you well know, the backbone of the economy here in Vermont and so many of our small towns. I walk around in Brattleboro and I'm, I'm really concerned about what my main street is gonna look like come the fall. And I know I'm not the only one who feels that way about their town. So um, certainly in economic development, ACCD is gonna be coming in, making their, you know, their best pitch for how best to use the money. And that's, I think that's the hardest part is the, the weighing the quick money out the door versus making sure we're targeting it well. And that tension uh, feels palpable, as you know, because we, we do want 
to get the relief out. And we also don't want to look back and feel like we missed the mark on something. So it's one of the ways in which I'll give a little plug for the chamber. It's one of the ways in which you are the eyes and ears of so many of the people on the call here, because you can be there on all of those Zoom calls, making sure something isn't forgotten. So uh, the beginning of a long conversation that's going to go through the spring, summer, and fall. But um, we know that we have to to invest in those businesses um, because that's what all, all of our towns rely on for that viability, so. I think that's important. And while we're all seeing um, the movement of the vaccine and hoping to get more and more and more people vaccinated, I, I think that's something that employers have been asking our governor, um, you know, what can we do to help? How can we help speed that up and in those conversations? So I think there's willing partners there. Uh, that, that's the best way to get through this, obviously, but the pain um, and the damage is just extraordinary on both the people of Vermont as well as the businesses. So thank you both for, for remembering that, you know, part of the goal here is, is not just to help people, but also to help the places where they work or else those people will need help uh, for, for even longer. So I think that's important important to know. Um, going to the workforce piece a little bit, we had several questions from people. Uh, Janet Bombardier from Chroma Technology down in Windsor, um, Renee Bourget Place from KPMG up in Colchester. Um, we've had some a variety of questions around um, the fact that we still have challenges finding employees for all types of jobs. Uh, curious about what actions are being taken to help specific actions to help get those workers into the workforce. The recruitment of talented workers is still an issue. College grads either, you know, come for work or stay in Vermont after graduation. How do we do that? How do we incentivize them to, to fill that workforce? Um, and then another question about, oftentimes we talk about you know, the college graduate and how do we get them to stay? But if you look at the workforce, only 26% of the population uh, of the jobs that are available here need a four-year degree. So, so many of our jobs don't. And so how do we recruit those? So uh, Senator Ballant, would you like to maybe yeah. start talking about that a Absolutely. little bit? Absolutely. You know, I think about this a lot, not just as a legislator, but also someone who taught for many years. And I, I mostly taught middle school, high school, and community college. And you can identify at a pretty young age, you know, those students in your classroom who really want to be heading into the workforce sooner rather than later. And we know in Vermont that we do an incredibly good job of graduating kids from high school. We don't do as good a job as making sure that this swath of kids who graduate from high school who aren't focused on college, that they have a pathway to get certification or additional training. And so, it's, it's work that I've done uh, both in the Economic Development Committee uh, in conjunction with our Education Committee, making sure there are really clear pipelines for people to get one or two credits at the, uh, the training center at their high school and do some handholding into the workforce. But I know the speaker and I have also talked about that there's an opportunity here with sort of revisioning the Vermont State Colleges. How can we make sure that as we are uh, shoring up the Vermont State Colleges that a really main goal of those uh, institutions is to make sure we're meeting families and students where they're at for the needs in their community in terms of uh, long range employment. And so I'm, I'm feeling actually more optimistic than I felt in a long time. I think it is the, the upside. Uh, so I'm in Wyndham County, southern part of the state. I know anecdotally and in my community, quite a few people who did flee from Connecticut and New Jersey and New York. And no, that's not gonna, that's not gonna be the tipping point, but we all know that we attract more talent here because of the stories people say back home, because it means it's more possible once you've made that move. So I feel like between that boost that we're getting, and of course, Betsy, you know, we've done a ton of work in my committee on remote working and, it, we kind of we were ahead of our time and we're continuing to look at that. How do we capitalize on this moment? And, you know, I don't know if we'll get to it on the call, but a concern I have too is what are we going to do with commercial property long term? We're not going to go back to where we were before. We know that. How do we uh, capitalize on that? So I am eager to hear from businesses on the call, uh, human resource officers on this call to let us know where are we missing the mark 
in terms of the work that we're doing on workforce development, because it's not from lack of trying. And sometimes I worry that we're putting our energy in the wrong places. So um, I, I'm eager to hear whether it's in the chat or following up with an email. So um, Speaker Kowinski, I wanna hear some of your comments around workforce and um, while you're speaking, uh, Senator ba ba Balint, if you could just look and um, there's a couple of questions about the workforce in the chat and specifically the state colleges. Um, and then also a comment about finding skilled workers in the Northeast Kingdom. So um, Senator, um, sorry, Speaker Kowinski, could you, I just, uh, I gave you a new title. How's that? Sorry about that. <laughs> no. I, I know how touchy the House and the Senate could be, so we no, won't. We're, we're, it's all good. We're just working so closely together, and you'll yeah. hear so much of, uh, we are, yeah, I think it's so critical, especially during this time in COVID, that we are all sharing the same goals and, um, and you know, policy positions because we have limited time and resources here. And so Senator Ballant is absolutely right. We have some incredible opportunities as we look at revisioning and supporting the Vermont State College system. Not only how do we create um, a, system, a sustainable higher education system in our state, but also what do we need to do to help those, uh, help those Vermonters who wanna get into the workforce in those key areas in healthcare and you know, we talk about plumbing and weatherization, all of these things um, make so much sense to come together. And you know, I understand how you know, our state college system and where they're located are the core economic drivers in, in some small towns across Vermont. And that's really important as we think about how we, how we build that out. So I think we have tremendous opportunity with Vermont State Colleges. I also think on the re retention and recruitment of workers. I, I hear about childcare all the time. And I know that we've already mentioned it, but I think if we can do more to make childcare more accessible um, and affordable for people, and we tackle our, our high housing costs and use the opportunity with COVID dollars to really put a big infusion into affordable housing, those are two key things that will help people want to stay here or come here because it's a supportive system that helps um, that helps us be able to go to work. And so those are the key policy issues that come to mind when I'm asked those that question. So, you know, we've touched on a couple of the really big issues, meaning big issues that we need to solve, um, big issues for the state, and really important issues for employers and employees, and that's broadband, uh, childcare, and housing. Um, I, I really, um, every, every discussion I'm on, there's very little disagreement <laughs> about these things. We need them all. We need more of it. We need it all to be more affordable. We've been working at these things for uh, several years. Um, and as you just mentioned, uh, you, you suggested that, you know, the, with the federal funds coming in, huge amounts that we've not necessarily anticipated. And, um, you know, is that, the, is that the answer? Is that where we can find uh, the amount of money? Because the, just for people listening, um, there's, since there's really little disagreement about wanting broadband everywhere or wanting more affordable or um, um, accessible childcare or more housing options, nobody disagrees with the need. It's a huge price tag. For yeah. each one of these, we're talking about three to five hundred million dollars minimum, and yeah. that that's a huge amount of money for for this state. So where do we get that money from? Yeah, it's it's a great point, Betsy. And when we were on this call earlier with the Joint Fiscal Office, unfortunately, in this package, well, the upside is there is money specifically for broadband in this this package. So it could be that there is a sizable chunk that we can put. Of course, you know the how it's rolled out, how you get it to the people uh, who have nothing versus the people who have inadequate versus you know it it is that the donut hole philosophy too, where you've got some connectivity in the middle of towns and the outlying ring doesn't have any. So it's it is complicated. I sat on finance um, last session and we wrestled with the issue of broadband, but I'm feeling more hopeful there because of the package uh, that's coming from the federal government. Unfortunately for housing, there isn't a similar uh, tranche of money in this uh, bill. 
And so we're going to have to continue to do what we've been doing, which is chipping away through a bunch of different programs. So we had the very successful, I felt, um, bipartisan support in between the legislature and the executive branch with the, the housing bond. I know many of us are keen to do another big ask. It's probably not <laughs> Betsy's smiling because we keep going down that road, but uh, certainly know that we still need a, a bigger investment there. And, you know, it's a tension that we have a little bit, I don't want to get too far down the, the rabbit hole here, but it's a little tension that we have with the treasurer because part of the reason we're downgraded is because of our demographics issue. We can't bring more people here if we don't have housing. And so it, it is it is trying to um, solve several issues at once, but we had success with um, downtown tax credits that we talked about. We've got a bill that's looking to um, do more density housing in, in downtown and, and village settlements. So it's going to be multi-pronged, but it's, it's not going to be enough. I'm not going to tell you it's enough. It's not, but um, I'm going to continue to be, you know, dying on the sword of more housing, you know, until I'm not in the legislature anymore, because I think without that, we, we're not going to attract the employers, employees that we need. So, um, and what was the other one? Childcare. I'm going to punt that one to Jill, or I'll just keep talking. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, that one of the one of the things we learned is also in the bill that's coming is money for childcare, and there's a tremendous amount of. Well, I feel like everything is a tremendous amount when we're talking about these aid packages, the using numbers that we've never used before when talking about the budget. Um, but there's money um, for education that's coming as well. And so I think that will be helpful as we work on this puzzle of how we put all of our policy goals and money um, connected to really put a strong infusion in that makes a difference. So, you know, our child care bill is moving out um, of human services tomorrow and they'll be moving through the process. And, um, you know, we talk a lot about what, how we can help low income families have access to, you know, more affordable child care. So we'll be able to see with these um, different pieces coming from the federal uh, relief package and what we already have in one time money to see how we can really really infuse some money that will make a difference in the long term. Hey Betsy, can I just jump in? Because I see a couple of things in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, question from Hava Walter asking about, does the broadband money go to subsidy or infrastructure? We don't have the details yet. We just have got the broad brushstroke so far in the coming week. Um, once it gets through uh, the house, We'll, we'll have more details from the congressional and maybe you'll get that briefing before, in some ways before we do, if you've got someone coming in to brief your members. The yeah. other thing I wanted to comment on is George Sales asked about the labor crunch, having to do more with less. Is there gonna be support for technology and infrastructure? I'm hoping that within this package, there is going to be more money that we can put in to specific technical supports and again, I know it's, we're going to sound like broken records here, but there's so much we still don't know yet. We're digging into the details and we're figuring out how we can swap certain money out for other money, which might give us more flexibility. So, but we know but, there's a need. Yeah. And I think it's, it's important to note too, that our, um, I'm getting a notice that my internet is unstable, which is exactly why I came to the office was to avoid that. So hopefully we can just keep plowing through like like everybody's uh, uh, working on. Um, but it's an indicative of what the problem is, right? As we invite more people here, what are they looking for? They're looking for a great place to stay. They want to have a great education system um, and they want to make sure that there's childcare and sort of all of those pieces. Um, to put things in context for our audience a little bit, um, we received uh, these big numbers, Speaker Kowinski, I think you mentioned, these are huge numbers. Just to put that in perspective for everybody, uh, we received, the state received 1.25 billion with a B uh, last year, and uh, we have a $6 billion budget. So that shows you just how amazingly big it is. And thanks to Senator Leahy and his advocacy for the small state minimum, we do know that we're getting another 
1.25 billion. And a lot of that money is already spoken for in the sense of where it's going. It, this chunk's going to broadband or education or, or vaccination help. So, so we understand that. We're just hoping that there are um, enough discretionary dollars to help businesses with additional grants, survivability grants, that type of thing. So um, that's helpful. Speaking of sort of the workforce, one area that we often hear a lot about uh, the workforce uh, needing more folks. You saw in the chat a little bit about needing two-year technical students or certifications. Vermont Tech weighed in there. Um, and the area of manufacturing, and we have a lot of manufacturing uh, spread out through all the state. In the House, the House Ways and Means Committee is taking up the uh, an expansion on the manufacturing tax credit. That's something that um, seems to be making some progress, something that we're supportive of. Um, I'm not sure how, how well you folks are uh, in depth in, into this, but Speaker Kwinski, is this something that you'd like to chat a little bit about? Sure. I you know, what we are doing right now in, uh, in our Ways and Means Committee led by Chairwoman Ansel is looking at some other ways that we can help support businesses across the state during this pandemic. And so there is um, the manufacturing, it, she was explaining it to me and I have to say, I, she was using hand graphics <laughs> it's fine it was but it was um it, it i i love talking tax policy with janet because i'm always learning new things and she, she was talking about how we have certain parts of the process covered and not the middle part and that was something for us to look at so they are continuing to do um that analysis and that working committee along with some some other tax bills um i don't those so are just under Those are just some things that um, the, the nudginess of tax policy, I agree with you. And I'm not sure everybody on the call wants to hear any of us talk through all the, the details of it. But I guess I would just say thank you for having the tax writing committee, the policy committee, which we we don't always find some of the work that are helpful. Finding this helpful is um, their attitude about how they're looking at businesses and thinking about other ways to help them in this pandemic is certainly helpful. Yeah, absolutely. I think too, Betsy, one of the things I've been thinking about um, is that, you know, although it's hard to, to hear if you're a, a business that's really, really struggled, not all of our businesses have struggled during this time. Some of our advanced man manufacturers, manufacturers in general actually have gone gangbusters during this time. It's part of the reason why we are in such a budgetary hole as we thought we'd be. And so I think oftentimes in Vermont, people forget that we have some amazing manufacturing that happens here. And it isn't the kind of old school, dirty manufacturing that people think of. And it's something that I've been exposed to because I serve on the Economic Development Committee and I get to go out on the shop floors. Of course, not now because of, of COVID, but that's a story that, that you know we have to do better about telling our middle school and high school kids that it is not manufacturing that was their dad's, their grandfather's you know, manufacturing. And that manu advanced manufacturing is pumping so much needed revenue into our bottom line. And so I'd love to talk more after this call and maybe we can pull together a group, a, a little bit of a think tank on this issue of what are those certification programs that we have that people are not enrolling in and where is the, you know, Where's the gap? And I know from being a teacher, so many of the families in my communities haven't known how to navigate the system. So that continues to be a challenge. And um, I know that we are doing a little bit more self-reflection, I think, in education right now, realizing we had several presidents who pushed really, really hard, both, both parties, Republicans and Democrats, pushing everybody to get a four-year degree we know you need additional education. It doesn't necessarily have to be a four-year degree. And it takes some time to trickle down to the educational system at large, but it's something that's very important to me. So I think um, it's interesting when you talk about um, maybe all of us as parents or as students not understanding what manufacturing is. I, I think that's probably true for, for a lot of jobs and they could 
probably all benefit from an injection of a big, big old traditional marketing campaign to, to sort of say what you just said for certain. Um, marketing isn't always um, looked upon um, in a, you know, the strongest need in the legislature. So I'd like to move from manufacturing to tourism a little bit, another really important sector, which you've both pointed out that has just been incredibly hurt by um, this pandemic sort of on the front lines with restaurants uh, lodging and, and retail. Um, and we are uh, hoping that as part of the budget uh, this year that we could see an injection of uh, larger funds for marketing to welcome people back when it's time, we realize it's not time yet. We, we wish it were, but when it's time, because Vermont really prides itself on hospitality. And one of the things that we have been doing a lot of lately is saying, please no, not now. And we're gonna to have to do something to counter that. So I'm curious if you both would um, support that initiative to have increased marketing to welcome people back to Vermont. Uh, I, it's something that I'm definitely interested in willing to look at. I think right now, again, I keep on going back to what, what do we know the federal funds can help us with, especially since they did mention tourism as part, helping businesses in the industry. And so um, absolutely, yes, let's look at what that would cover and if this is something that could be part of it, for sure. I also... Um, I'm, we're starting to learn, and I don't know how much of this would cover, but um, we also know that towns are going to be getting a, a special allotment of money as well. And so there may be some interesting opportunities there to figure out how towns can use the money coming in to have their own local efforts as well in terms of how you open up. Um, and so a couple different areas to look at to see how we can work together to address the issue of marketing and how we can open back up in a safe way. <laughs> I think that's what we all want. Um, Senator Ballant? Yeah, you know, I was thinking about this a lot, how we have asked the tourism, the hospitality industry, the restaurant industry to take some of the biggest, most sustained hits in this emergency. And, you know, it, it, it was so clear from those first few weeks, you even had Senator Leahy at one point on the news saying, you know, we usually are welcoming you to Vermont. We really want you to stay away. And I think we're going to have to rebuild the Vermont brand in, in we are, we're gonna have to do a reboot. We're gonna have to figure out, you know, how do we use the fact that we did such a great job during the pandemic that people did feel safe here. We need to use those stories of those people who fled from Boston and New York and um, felt like this was a safe place to be. There's an opportunity here and I don't wanna miss it. And so I think the federal funds are gonna give us more flexibility to give the kind of infusion that this industry needs right now. People feel completely kicked to the curb and don't know how they're gonna make it through. And I know, you know, you and I both know we've got a couple uh, folks who've, who've been around for a while who, who don't believe in investing in, in tourism and marketing. We all know that that's a reality. I wanna continue the smart targeted um, work that we've done you know, pinpointing those areas of New York and Boston and DC and, and New Jersey that we know are coming up here and you and amplifying that with federal dollars. So I think there's an opportunity here and I think we owe it to those folks who've really taken it so, so hard. So um, I'm not going to go back to workforce, but the chat is overly active right now with lots of workforce, but we can uh, download that and send that to that you. That would be great. Folks have it. Um, but there are two issues that did come up in the chat just now that I think with our last 10 minutes, I'd like to try to hit on both of those quickly yeah, and sure. keep, us all, keep us on, on time. Uh, one of those issues is about unemployment insurance costs, which um, I'm scrolling back. I just see that even if manufacturers have done well during the past year, how can we prevent long-term economic impacts, uh, especially on UI costs? And uh, we also had Tim Smith from um, the RDC up in Franklin County ask about that in uh, the registration questions. And there's some current proposals now that extend relief from charges uh, to employers and also cap the amount of rate uh, um, 
upgrades to prevent rate shock. Um, but then there's also a proposal that would increase the weekly benefit amount by 20%, mm -hmm. which would cost employers 35 million. And there's no doubt that the unemployed need help, but they're getting quite a bit of that help. And we've just seen that not only previous bills, but this new federal bill, there's also additional help there. So I'm curious if you want to comment um, about is, you know, are, what are we can expect for UI changes uh, this year? So I'll just jump in and say my committee is still very much in the middle of this conversation. And there we had you know, fast and furious conversations and emails over this, you know, this break that we were just talking about. And so this week in my committee is where we're going to get into the details. We haven't, we haven't made any decisions. We know that this tension is absolutely in play here. And in terms of rate relief, like we may have to be doing some kind of, of stepped, you know, measurement in. So it's not such a shock to the system. And so obviously, you know, we don't have much time left on the call, but we're taking it up in the Senate Economic Development and Housing Committee this week. Senator Sorokin is the chair. If you haven't already reached out uh, to him with, with your thoughts on this, please get that to us. Great, thank you. Uh, Speaker Kerensky, did you want to weigh in on UI, even though it's in the, it's in the Senate now? Or we did, you said the Senate would take the lead on this one. So we'll be Great. taking that up when it comes over in the coming weeks. One of the other things quickly um, in the chat that was brought up was something that you folks had brought up and that is about the future of commercial real estate and what we can do innovatively there. I see uh, my chat is scrolling rather quickly, but I think that came in from uh, Meg McGovern, uh, who, you know, with the urgent need for housing, is there any thoughts on how to help housing developers who continue to find permitting timelines that expand due to increased litigation that stall projects and now construction costs that have doubled? But where are funds going to affordable housing agencies, purchasing motels to help vulnerable groups, but wasn't sure if there was any funding for these private developers who could help convert that to help with our housing. Any thoughts on that? I know that within my committee, it has just been mentioned in passing. It's not something we've had the bandwidth, frankly, to take up yet, but I know that we're looking at all avenues and it's certainly something <laughs> offline that we've talked about that you're going to have space that is not going to be used, uh, you know, around commercial purposes. So where's the opportunity there? And sometimes it takes a little bit of um, being willing to look at it from a different angle. And so we were able to come together with the governor on some, you know, targeted relief to uh, landlords to bring uh, uh, units back online. And so that was, you know, we were using public funds going to private. Uh, landlords, but we were able to bring online a lot more units. So there's another, I think, opportunity here. And I don't have more than an idea about it. And I know my committee feels the same way. So again, if you have some thoughts on how we can make this a reality, especially as we see uh, what's coming around um, the federal package, I'm completely open to that because we need thousands of more units, not hundreds. So yeah, I, I agree with Senator Ballon. I think we need a broader strategy around it, but I will say that I am seeing it in the creativity of navigating our COVID world, it happening in little in little parts across the state. And uh, one in particular uh, that I've been watching closely is bringing Burlington High School, downtown Burlington, into the Macy's building. And I mean, incredible amount of uh, collaboration to pull this off in a couple months. And it, I have to tell you, if you haven't seen the photos or been in there yet, please look. What a, what a transformation of a department store into a high school downtown. And um, I'm really proud of the effort that we were able to put forth, but that's the kind of creativity that we can be using uh, during these times. And I've, I've heard and had conversations with people about what, you know, we're talking about childcare and we're talking about housing and how does that fit into these open spaces? And so I think we have an opportunity here to really look at it in a holistic way and come up with some creative ideas. Well, thank you both. We're just about out of time. I'm gonna ask you one last question, uh, sort of a, a quick quick question. We know from what you've, what you've said here today that your focus is really gonna be how do we deploy the money that's coming to the feds in the right ways in all the systems to help us get through that pandemic. So thank you for that. 
what else would you, one, one quick thing that you think that we should be watching for that either the House or the Senate is going to be focused on in the remaining uh, couple of months? Speaker Kowinski? Sure, absolutely. Well, I would just want to give a shout out to one of my constituents, Megan Humphrey, who's a small business in the old North End. Hi, Megan. I, for us, um, in the House pension, our unfunded pension liability um, is a huge burden on our budget and future budgets. And I think it's important that we save people's pensions while also having a strategy to tackle um, this problem so that it's not uh, taking up more and more of our general funds and leaving out other opportunities to help businesses um, across the state. So that's something that we are we are focused on. Thank you. Senator Ballant. You know, Betsy, I had it right at the top of my head and then I lost it, but let me think for a minute. So the- It's fine. It's fine. The, 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 oh, I know what it was. I know what it was. So one of the things that we have been wrestling with for several sessions now is looking at these smaller towns that can't be part of the TIF program and looking at what we're calling mini TIFs. And so um, allowing smaller towns that need a more, you know, targeted investment in their, you know, down, down village or downtowns um, has been exciting though. It does, it always comes up against a brick wall in my finance committee. So one of the things that is intriguing to me is that I saw that there is additional money in this federal fund package going to water and sewer upgrades. And that is also the kind of investment that smaller towns and villages around the state need in order to grow. And so I'm very, um, curious about how we might be able to employ that. Thank you. Thank you both so very much for your time today. We really appreciate it. We continue to think of ourselves as policy partners as we try to do what's best for Vermont and get businesses and people back on the road to recovery. For all of you who have attended today, this wraps up our virtual policy series event. Thank you for attending. Thank you to Speaker Kulisi and uh, Senator uh, Ballant. We really appreciate your time. Next Monday at three o'clock, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Executive Chief Policy Officer Neil Bradley will join us to share his perspective on federal policy that impacts businesses. Thank you all and have a great afternoon.